Hello there. We are in week 25 of a 52-week Sunday talk series based on the book by Orrin J. Sofer, Your Heart Was Made for This. And last week, we uh, started on the theme of equanimity. This week, we'll continue on this theme of exploring reactivity, equanimity, and the Enneagram. Uh, today's talk is going to focus on the Enneagram of avoidances and how we can somatically resource ourselves around our types avoidances so that we can, again, continually enter into a greater state of wholeness. So as an interspiritual unity minister, I come from the perspective that everything in the manifest world contains within it this one primal source of all things that uh, embedded in all material substances is the presence of invisible, indivisible, unmanifest, and unconditioned reality. As Father Thomas Merton wrote in his poem, Hagia Sophia, there is in all things a hidden wholeness. And that includes you. There is within each and every one of us a hidden wholeness. And I love the term hidden in this context, because as we talk about the Enneagram of avoidances, we're talking about even parts of ourselves that are hidden from our own conscious everyday view. It's a place that we avoid within ourselves. We heard about our reactivity last week from this somatic or energetic perspective. And I really, really recommend that you listen to last week's talk before listening to this one. This one will stand alone, but it could be very helpful for you to get some basis in this notion of reactivity from the somatic point of view. So as a reminder, the Enneagram circle symbolizes our wholeness, right? This hidden wholeness. It's a wholeness that we deny ourselves, actually, when we live merely identified with our personality types, our personas. So the ego, if you think about this, the ego cannot experience essence. Most of us are trying to get at God or wholeness or unit of consciousness from the standpoint of the ego, not recognizing that it is the surrender or the release of the egoic attachment to its own identity that enables us to enter into our wholeness. So, so remember that this is a wholeness that we deny ourselves when we live merely identified with our, uh, what we'll call our ego ideal, which is different uh, in accordance with our Enneagram type structures. So uh, we want to take a look at this from the point of view that you might think, oh yes, I'm claiming wholeness, but so long as you have this notion, I am this and I am not this, that you are very likely uh, segregating uh, the totality of being your essence even, right? You're, you're separating yourself even from your own essence, your I am this and I am not this, and then this is bad, and this is good, and we're talking about equanimity, and we can find ourselves using that same polarizing framework based on duality and a belief in separation, which is equanimity is good, and disturbance is bad, right? So I want to look at it from a different framework of really uh, comprehending that, that equanimity is a state of inner balance that is akin to an integrated state that actually welcomes the totality of being our own and that of uh, unconditioned reality, everything, everyone, right? So looking at it from this standpoint, uh, I want to add that, especially as a unity minister, it's important for me to say, because unity can often be equated with this like positive spirituality. And uh, the most superficial version of that is a dual, uh, is a separating philosophy that says, ooh, stay positive and reject all the negative feelings you have, right? We call that toxic positivity. And Episcopalian priest, one of my favorite authors, Cynthia Bergeau says, don't correct back to positivity if what you want is equanimity. So I love that quote. So apropos for today, she also writes, kenosis, kenosis, and self-calming are opposite ends of the spectrum. So kenosis, as a reminder, is the self-emptying that is at core um, in the way that we do Enneagram inner work in Evolving Enneagram. So kenosis as an act of a gesture of self-emptying is a path toward reclaiming wholeness because 
the emptying is the emptying of the egoic identity, who I think I am. I surrender who I think I am and all the attributes related to that to kind of come into the knowing of who I really am or arguably what I really am, what you really are, which is essence or spirit. So from this framework, this week, I would like to look at the Enneagram of Avoidances. I first learned this through the work of Hamid Ali, whose pen name is A.H. Almas, in his book, Facets of Unity. Got the book right here, handy as well. There are a few nuances where um, I adapted the language um, to, to better fit like my understanding over the years of, of this framework. So I want to say that it's sourced from his work. So I want to give him credit for that. And I also don't want to say that this is all exactly what he teaches. Uh, my work is also informed by the work of Marion Gilbert, uh, who taught me the somatic Enneagram uh, work that is the basis of my work and this week as well as last week's teaching. Okay, uh, now that you have the framework, I want to share uh, that Hamid Ali wrote this in Keys to the Enneagram, the avoidances refer to nine behavioral manifestations that each of the nine points prefers to avoid for fear of exposing vulnerability and of undermining the ego ideal. And he further writes, the avoidance for each fixation refers to the deficient way the person experiences the loss of connection with essence. So, from this framework, remembering some of you may already know the Enneagram of Avoidances. I'm sure I've talked about it in, in past posts and teachings, but I invite you to consider it from the somatic resourcing perspective that we've been exploring, which is when you experience it or even when you hear me talk about it, I'm going to invite you to consider how you avoid this area throughout the week, even in small ways, maybe even especially in small ways, because we want to start with baby steps in terms of embracing this aspect that we avoid, right? So I want you to consider it not just as an idea, but breathe into um, your body, becoming aware of the felt sense of your body and see if you can make contact with what part of you uh, gets triggered, right, has reactivity when the area you try your best to avoid uh, comes up, right? So with that, I'll, I'll give some examples as we go along to help you. So let's start with the body types again. So the body type, ego ideal, the eight is I am powerful or I am protective. And so on the Enneagram of avoidances, the eight avoids weakness, so just consider that even in small ways, if you're an eight this week, this non-identification with the parts of you, I mean, many eights don't even see it, right? It takes a lot of inner work before you even realize, oh, I just barriered myself from a feeling or an experience of weakness. So again, you can try to breathe uh, into this space, but if there's an sense of overwhelm, I invite you to breathe into the area of well-being and tap into resources, which we're going to talk about at the very end of today's talk. So for the eight, the avoidance is weakness. For the nine, the ego ideal is that of being open-minded and good-natured. And so the avoidance is of conflict. And so this can feel like a very painful absence of loving holding, which is usually like the aching and even scary emotional or existential state for a nine to be in. So again, the avoidance of conflict. And remember, we're not just talking about outer conflict, but a sense of inner conflict, right? So we want to experience or breathe into how, what comes up, how it shows up inside of you in this practice. So the one, the ego ideal is I'm good, I'm right. And so the one avoids wrongness, but it's important to remember that you as a one, as the brilliant presence um, uh, that you are, that you don't actually need to be right to be fundamentally right at the truth of your being, right? Not right in the everyday worldly sense to be fundamentally right. So just notice how you do whatever you can to avoid wrongness. So notice even the small ways you won't let that sense happen. Maybe it's the ways you hustle 
to make sure that you're correct, you know, or it's maybe in the way that you make others wrong for you to be right. Just notice and see if you can breathe into it and make space for it. Because if you can feel into that sense beneath it is your wholeness. Beneath it is a capacity, is a more essential quality. For the hard types, the twos relate to this ego ideal of I am caring, I am needed, and then avoids the feeling or experience of neediness. Ew, if you're a two, that's how it should feel. Not for everybody else necessarily, but ew, like the last thing you want to be is needy, right? And at the same time, if you've been avoiding your own uh, needs or neglecting your own needs um, for a long time, then chances are you actually have a great degree of neediness, right? But entering into it, you eventually feel into the essence of your own innate lovability. So it's in there. But if you avoid that area, you don't even get at your lovability either, right? So the ego ideal for the three is I am successful, I am productive. And so of course, the three avoids feeling like a failure. It avoids the experiences of failure in the world, and especially even how it translates inside. And part of how we know this is even when we experience outer failure, the three likes to positively reframe outer failure so that we don't have to experience ourselves um, in that state of feeling like a failure, right? When actually, if you drop into the emptiness inside as a three, welcoming it, that emptiness, it helps you to open to the arising of your true self, which uh, Hamid Ali calls within you, the pearl beyond price. So beautiful. So the four is ego ideal is I am unique. I am authentic. And so within that, the four avoids um, the feeling of despair that's related to, it's kind of related to the avoidance of ordinariness. But ultimately, it's actually that beneath that ordinariness is a sense of despair or feeling lost. Um, the way uh, Hamid Ali teaches it is it's like this, um, if we have skillful support or able to tolerate such states of like lostness inside, it's almost like um, the willingness to endure that feeling of being empty and without substance and not knowing what your real identity is, that the path in and through that, the welcoming of that actually makes room for true connection to source, um, to, to arise, right? So for the head types, uh, I'd, for the five, the ego ideal is I am knowledgeable. Uh, I am self-reliant as an, is related to that as well. So the five avoids like inner, um, emptiness, I'd say another word for that would be like inner scarcity, right? So that, but that emptiness arises uh, when the five sees that the mental knowledge that you've accumulated is abstract, conceptual, and therefore lifeless. And um, by seeing that, then that your so-called clarity, which is really just clarity of like intellect or clarity of thinking is not that deeper clarity of presence. That's this instrument of understanding all levels of being, like, like a true all-knowingness that is heart-based as well as mental, you know, even body-based. So I am reliable is the ego ideal of the six. I'm reliable. I'm responsible. And the way it's described in the Enneagram of avoidance is deviance, that the six avoids deviance. That sounds kind of weird. So I want to offer my translation of that. If you think about the conformity of the six to stay in alignment with uh, with whether your allies, the people who you feel create your network of safety, if you will, or whether you're a social six and you ally with a belief system. So this deviance is there is a lot of insecurity that comes from, from not um, conforming. To that right so it it's like deviance and um disloyalty are kind of related in this in this framework so at least that's my take and so uh for the seven i am cheerful i am okay represent the ego ideals for the seven i know i've talked about this before but again let's really consider this not just from a mental framework but what is arising for you in your body um when you're not these things. So the seven avoids pain or limitation. And so I want you to feel into those moments when you're right there and you're feeling limited, bored, in pain, whatever it is, 
And can you breathe with it? Can you breathe around it? If it's overwhelming to breathe with it and stay with it, see if you can somatically bring your breath to just breathe around that space. And then if you need to breathe into a space of actual well-being, um, how is this different from spiritual bypassing, right? Because if you're like, well, okay, if you're inviting me to just not necessarily go into the hard part, but like breathe into the space of well-being, how is that not like bypassing and just focusing on the good like, like sevens tend to do? Well, for all the numbers, the idea here is that you are breathing into a felt sensation, an actual experience that's embodied, very different from the idea, like a positive idea. You're breathing into an actual felt resource. And so related to that, I want to talk about resources. Uh, from the somatic Enneagram perspective, uh, Marianne Gilbert teaches, um, uh, again, from, from a lot of training uh, in uh, her physical therapy practice and beyond, Internal resources are qualities of being that are inherent and can be developed over time. And these are life-giving. They return you back to well-being. And so there are resources inside of ourselves, like open-heartedness and um, true clarity of mind, et cetera, uh, that are within us. But there are also external resources, which are ways we can reach for and recognize what what means us well in the world and what supports us, right? Our evolving Enneagram community is a resource for many of you. Um, so being in a loving and compassionate, accepting community is definitely a resource. Having connection and authentic connections an external resource. So related to this, I'll close by sharing that Sofer in his book talks directly about resources. And he also talks about the need for growing in equanimity by, uh, by addressing our smaller moments of reactivity, right? Like as I shared across the whole Enneagram, I, um, I think it's important for you to remember without the support of uh, an expert, a professional, I don't necessarily recommend that you jump into like, you know, your area of difficulty. I know like sometimes like those of you who are like eights or like, I'll take on this challenge and I'm just going to make myself feel my vulnerability, you know, actually that actually entrenches your type further because it's the eight's ego that is very much about attachment to feeling the strength of meeting the challenge. So if you think about it, you know, it's actually a gift to receive as an eight and to let it be easy and to not uh, demand of yourself like another battle or another challenge. Just now I'm going to face my avoidance, you know? So just think about how your ego or your personality type wants to lay hold of this journey and direct it for all numbers. So Sofa writes, just as we grow in patience, by learning to be with impatience. Recall that we mature in equanimity uh, through learning to be with reactivity. Equanimity ripens slowly at the edges of our reactivity rather than in the throes of a meltdown. Recollect the fundamental trauma-informed principle of starting small. Attend to minor annoyances and breathe patiently. Notice any grasping after mild pleasure and practice letting both the pleasure and the grasping sensations flow through you. If you find yourself stuck in reactivity, find ways to step back from its intensity. So, Lean into external resources such as friends, art, music, or nature to get perspective. Lean into community, especially if you are reacting to social inequity. Next, this is still sofa, by the way. Allow yourself to feel a small amount of your reactivity for a moment or two, then shift your attention back to something neutral or grounding. Move back and forth like this between resource and reactivity. As you feel able, make space for your feelings, remembering that all emotions are natural and temporary. All right. So with that, uh, I just want to say thank you for being with me all these weeks. We only have one more talk before um, we uh, break for CPE, but I, I will continue these talks. Oh, I do want to tell you that this summer, I want to uh, do a little bit, have a little fun this summer. So we'll continue on the book themed talks. I think we're going to do a few more like interview-based talks. So I'm excited to have that happen. And in the meantime, peace through wholeness. Namaste. Bye.